Hi there, and welcome. Greetings from uh, Fresno, California, where I preach for the College Church of Christ, bringing you this COVID era sermon from 1 Timothy chapter 3. When you think of the church, what idea, what image pops in your head? For me, I can't help but picture my parents who for 50 years ministered together. My dad preached most of that time for the church, a church in Lebanon, Tennessee, but their lives were just defined by church. It was everything for them. Or my mom's parents, her dad, Ted Waller, was a longtime preacher, largely in Canton, Ohio area. But for them, my grandparents, church was not just some ancillary part of life. It was life. It was everything that they did and thought. And they lived, both of them ministered in an era when they were able to see great growth in their churches and, and, and receive some kind of accolades for you know, churches really doing and starting new things. And, and, and my own call into ministry, as I think about that, and as may, perhaps you think about your situation, your church today, and, and we live in a time of declining churches. How are we to think of church? What image should come into our head as we think about church? I think it's a crucial time to think about this. And perhaps this picture from 1 Timothy chapter 3 will be helpful to us and helpful to you in your situation. I want to read the text that was assigned to me, 1 Timothy 3, 14 through 16. Hear the word of the Lord. I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these instructions to you so that, if I am delayed, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God which is the church of the living God, pillar and bulwark of the truth. Without any doubt, the mystery of our religion is great. He was revealed in flesh, vindicated in spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among Gentiles, believed in throughout the world, taken up in glory. Can you just pray with me? God, we ask that you would enlighten the eyes of our heart to see the church as you see it, to help us to understand who it is we're supposed to be and what we're supposed to do. Pray this through Christ Jesus. Amen. Well, uh, the pastoral epistles, that's First, Second Timothy, Titus, they have a different feel to them, but yet there are some verses that are incredibly familiar to us. Verses like, for the love of money is the root of all evil. Or, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Or this one that means so much to us. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So many familiar verses. And this text from 1 Timothy 3 is perhaps not as familiar, at least not to me, as it is perhaps to as those other verses. But its concept may be more crucial than those other verses. So let's camp out at that for a moment. And to help us organize our thoughts, I want to just share three observations on this text. The first observation is this. It comes from verse 15. That we ought to behave as if we belong to God's household. Behave as if you belong to the house of God. It's one thing to know how to behave. It's another thing to behave that way. Some parents have discovered during the coronavirus homeschooling or distance learning season that their kids are maybe have a harder time um, learning it's harder to instruct them than they might have realized they may have more appreciation for the teachers that may be what the inspiration that caused one parent to write on the back of their SUV you lied my child is not a joy to have in class but we all know that some of us live and we all do this occasionally we live by situational behavior that we behave depending on the situation or depending on who's watching. Sometimes it's, if a boss is watching, we may act differently than we're just with the coworkers or when our spouse is present or when our parents are watching. We behave differently in different situations. And this is a, a challenge for Christians because Christians aren't supposed to behave one way when they're in church, one way when they're with Christians, and a totally different way when they're out in the world. But yet this is a constant temptation for many Christians. And so Paul here says we ought to behave, we ought to know how to behave in the house of God. And this word house, of course the Greek word oikos, can be an actual house, the actual physical structure. But the word, the word house can mean like in a metaphorical sense, like 
the House of Windsor. You may know of other houses from literature or from film and TV. The, the house of some name, some family, means that if you belong to that family, to that name, whether by blood or you work for that, that house, that you represent that house, there can never be a time when you belong to a household, there can never be a time when you can remove the coat of arms from that house. You belong to the house. So everything you do represents the house. The behavior is so important. And the New Testament depicts contrasting kinds of behavior, especially in Paul, where he is a black and white thinker. He thinks in, in contradictory terms uh, of the behavior of Christians, the behavior of pagans, the behavior inside of Christ, outside of Christ, right? So it's like in Ephesians 2, 3, you behaved one way when you were children of disobedience. But now, later in the book, as children of light, you're to behave this way, right? Paul himself, he was so careful to behave in a way that was modeling the kind of behavior fitting of Christians. Like he says in 2 Corinthians 1.12, he says, we behaved honorably among you. It's not just important for Paul to behave this way. He thinks it's important for all Christians to behave in a way that reflects well upon the name of God. I really wish that all Christians understood how crucial their behavior is to the, the work of the church. We have a good friend who was a longtime professor at West Virginia University, and I knew him as a child, and then I worked there as a campus minister later. And he was a beloved professor on campus. Uh, students just loved and raved about his classes, but he also had very high standards. He was a teacher of teachers. He was an educator for aspiring educators. And so in his classes with his, these wannabe teachers, he would say to them, look, if you're looking for a job, you can check in at 7.30 and check out at 3.30. You're looking in the wrong place if you think teaching is for you. Because to be a teacher means that you are always visible. You never know when one of your students or former students might be watching. Same is true for so many professions that even in your contracts, you may have a termination clause for unbecoming behavior outside of the workplace. You can't simply have the excuse, oh, it's my private Twitter account. Oh, it's my personal time. That may work for politicians, but it doesn't work for many people in real life. If you do something that reflects poorly upon the institution or the organization you work for, they can be cause for termination. As Christians, shouldn't we understand that everything we do works together in representing God's name? I wish we really understood that more clearly. And maybe what's going to be crucial for some people is to think to themselves, oh, so-and-so might be watching. That's perhaps what's behind verse 14, where Paul says, I hope to come to you soon. Oh, Paul might show up. We better be careful. Maybe we need to think, oh, my boss might show up. Oh, so-and-so from church might be there. What if my sister, whoever it is that will help you behave the way you should, picture that person. But ideally, we should have in our heads clearly marked out, we belong to the house of God. Behave this way. The second observation I would make from this text is this. The church exists to support the mystery of Jesus. There are, of course, three parallel terms in here, household of God, church of the living God, and pillar, bulwark of the truth. Pillar is pillar of truth, how we get the title for this text. But household of God, we just talked about that, church of the living God, that means something, right? Especially in a world where you have emperors who declare themselves to be a God, or you have dusty idols sitting on shelves that people claim to be a God. But our God is not like that. Our God is a living God. And the fact that we serve a living God should deeply affect the way we think about our responsibility as people who belong to the church of the living God, right? David, when Nathan confronted him, David had had a moment of total insanity where he had behaved horribly. And Nathan was confronting him, and he began by telling him the story about the, the man who stole the neighbor's sheep. 
And David answered in words that would condemn himself. He said, as God lives, such and such should happen. David knew that the fact we have a living God impacts how we are supposed to live. But this third parallel term, pillar and bulwark of the truth, is what I want to think more about and really what will shape the rest of our, our message here. And the, the idea that we are the pillar or the bulwark of truth, it means that we are the supporting foundation for the truth. It means we are not the truth. Church is not the substance of God's salvation. The church is not the good news. The church is not what God does in the world. The church supports the good news of Jesus. The church supports the truth of what God has done, is doing, and will do through Jesus Christ. And this is important to remember, our place. Uh, my son, older son, lives outside of Washington, D.C. His apartment there in Arlington, Virginia, overlooks the construction site for Amazon's second headquarters. You remember the big thing about Amazon choosing their second headquarters. Well, it's outside his apartment window. And he's been able to watch, and I was there in August and took a picture of how the, it was it's, it's a huge, it's hard to kind of comprehend the scale of this place. 50,000 people are going to work in this building or in a couple other buildings, but 50,000 people, it's going to be in a massive structure. Seeing them do all the prep work, all the preparation for the foundations, doing the pilings down into the, into the uh, bedrock. And then I was there in November and saw as they're still pouring tons of concrete. The amount of work that goes into the foundation of this kind of building is unbelievable. But you know what? When the building is finished, and here's an artistic rendering of the finished product, when that building is finished, people come to work in that building or they come to do business there, they're not going to think to themselves, whoa, I wonder if the foundation is amazing. I wonder what the foundation looks like. No. They're going to appreciate, they're going to marvel at, they're going to think about the structure. And this should put the church's role in perspective here. That what we are to do is not to be the thing people talk about. We're not the structure that is somehow going to save the world. Our job is just to support that. We are the foundation, the pillar that holds it up. This is our role. The great religious teacher, Abraham Joshua Heschel, he once said this, humility is the beginning and end of religious thinking, the secret test of faith. There is no truth without humility, no certainty without contrition. Humility and contrition. Do we know how our church, how the church is at its best? It's at its best when it understands it is in a subservient role. Its job is to lift up, to support the mystery of Jesus. And this brings me to my final point, which really is a combination of the first two. And that's this. The church is to be a supportive community. The church is to be a supportive community community. And I hope this will be a freeing concept as it takes some of the burden of success, of the standards of this world, standards of how people measure what is a good church and a bad church. I hope it will be a freeing concept because this is crucial for us to understand if we're going to grasp this image from 1 Timothy 3. Being supportive plays out on two levels. First, just as I've, as I've described, the church's job is to uphold the truth and the mystery of Jesus. What does that mean, uphold the truth and the mystery? The truth here in Timothy is a contrast to myths. Myths are these things that people build their lives upon. They're these false ways of understanding reality, of understanding the world, of understanding what's important. There's so many people that build their lives, center their attention, focus all their energy upon myths. But as opposed to that is truth. So we find in 1 Timothy 2.4, God desires everyone to know the truth. 
the opposite of this is in chapter 6, verse 5, where we find these false teachers who are promoting wives' tales, superstitions, conspiracies, myths. They are bereft of the truth, it says there. What is the truth? Truth is Jesus Christ. The truth is Jesus Christ, because our job as the church is to hold up the powerfully good news of the truth of Jesus Christ. And the truth now brings us to this word mystery. Because mystery, in a New Testament sense, in the first century sense, was not some detective novel. The mystery was an inaccessible truth, an inaccessible reality that humans could never know. And most of the religions of the first century were mystery cults where they celebrated this mystery and people could come and they could look up, ooh, wow, there's a mystery there, but they could never access, access it. Maybe some wealthy people could kind of buy their way into certain levels where then the priests or the prophets of that mystery cult might reveal to them certain mysteries, kind of like the Church of Scientology today. But ordinary people had no chance of ever learning any of the mysteries. This is what is amazing about the religion of our living God, is that God has taken the mysteries of the entire universe and through Jesus Christ, has made them freely accessible to anyone. But anyone through Jesus Christ can know the mystery of everything. The church's job is not to hide this mystery, is not to be the mystery, but is to support the revealed mystery, the truth of Jesus Christ. This, this is our job, is to support the temple the building, the structure, the centerpiece, the showcase, Jesus. So the last portion of our text in verse 16, it contains this, this idea that um, Jesus, it's like a Christ hymn, right? It's kind of like Philippians 3, that Christ was re revealed, vindicated, seen, proclaimed, believed in, taken up. That this Jesus that we lift up, has such a broad impact on so many people. And that's where this idea, this mystery of godliness, mystery, the NIV says mystery of godliness. And this idea of godliness goes back to my first observation about behavior. How is it that we support the mystery of godliness? By being godly people. We together come together to support the mystery of Jesus by living lives that honor the name, the house of God. That's one way we're a supportive community. Another way we're a supportive community is that we support each other. We support the truth of Jesus by coming together to do it. This message about the pillar of truth, it wasn't that Timothy was the pillar of truth. It's that the church is the pillar of truth. It's the church that's the pillar of truth. Some churches today have totally lost sight that they are not the truth. Jesus is the truth. That it's our job simply to lift up the truth. And what's even worse is that many churches have created a whole celebrity cult around a person, the celebrity pastor, the rock star musician, the, the Christian who is amazing in their skills and abilities to go out and do this or do that. The church's job is simply to come together in godly lives, lifting up the amazing truth and mystery of Jesus Christ. George Marsden, in his book, Fundamentalism and American Society, he describes how American fundamentalism has warped the way American Christians think about the church. He writes, the individual stood alone before God. His choices were decisive. The church, while important as a supportive community, was made up of free individuals. You see here in Marsden's writing, supportive community is there, but it's, 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 it's something that doesn't matter. It's just kind of like a, a help group for all the individuals who are the superstars of the church. Sung Chan Ra, his book, Next Evangelicalism, and many other books he's written, he builds upon Marsden's concept here with these words. Life and ministry in the local church, therefore, became the race to please the individual so that the pews might be filled. 
Do you see what has happened with people's thinking about the church? For them, the center of church life is about pleasing individuals. It's about people. People have become everything for the church. And that's not the way it's supposed to be. People are merely to be the supportive community together, lifting up the true showcase, Jesus Christ. So our job as Christians, as pastors, leaders, simply to build supportive community, it supports one another as we support Jesus. And this has been a, a struggle for me, can I be honest? As someone coming into ministry in the shadow of so many people who have done so many amazing things. I kind of get the picture that to be successful as a church person, you have to grow a church. You have to have a church that just is really going great guns, that's becoming the biggest and the best. That's the way to really be the church, to be a church leader. Now, when I was called into ministry, my first ministry work was actually missionary work. I was felt drawn by the Holy Spirit to go to Prague, Czechoslovakia, later Czech Republic, right after the fall of communism. And I went there first as a seminary student, took a year off of seminary, went and spent a year in Prague. And this was right after the Velvet Revolution. And that year I fell in love with Prague. I fell in love with Czech history, culture, people, and had really decided in my heart I was going to go back there. But that first year, I remember November of 1990, was the one-year anniversary of their uh, their, their defeat of communism, and they gathered together for a huge celebration of their freedom. There were hundreds of thousands of people there on Winchester Square in downtown Prague, and I had a, a VIP pass to go up toward the front to the stage because I was an American, and President George H.W. Bush was going to be speaking along with the Czech president, Václav Havel. And so there I was in this sparsely gathered VIP area, looking down the tightly packed crowds of Czechs. And while I thought to myself, wow, the God is going to help me do something amazing here for these Czech people. I'm going to convert hundreds, thousands of people perhaps. But I'm looking down at it. There's another feeling going on within me. I'm hearing them sing the songs of revolution, chant their chants. And I'm looking and I'm saying, I wish I could belong to that. Isn't that interesting? Me, they're bringing the great things of Jesus, wanting to belong to these people. Time goes on, Julie and I, we married, a finished seminary, we moved to Prague, and we found church work to be difficult. We had friends in other places doing mission work that had seemed to have great success, but there in Prague it was a difficult work. And we had a church, though, we had good things happening, it was just it was slow and arduous. And there, there were some things that happened, though, that I felt like was drawing more and more into Czech society, understanding the language, um, these kind of things. But one thing that happened that really kind of stood out to me as a special moment, 1998, were the Winter Olympics, when it was the first time that professional hockey players were allowed to play in the Olympics. You may remember that Olympic, from, the Olympic Games from Nagano, Japan, when the American and Canadian teams, whose players predominate throughout the National Hockey League. They were expected to be in the finals, playing each other. Everybody thought that. The American team struggled, though, and they actually lost in the quarterfinals to a little team from the Czech Republic with their goalie, Dominic Hasek. The Americans, they were so mad, they trashed their hotel that night. But in the semifinals, the Czech team played the Canadians, gold medal favorites, and beat them. So I remember the finals very clearly. It was a four o'clock in the morning Czech local time when the game was playing live in Japan. In our area, there were 70,000 people who lived in these communist era apartment buildings. And I remember looking out my window, every light was on. I could hear TVs in the apartments above me and below us and beside us, that game. Wow, it was amazing. The Czechs won with a shot from Svoboda, one to nothing. The, the crowd went wild. I could hear people above me. Everybody was cheering, and I was a part of it. Still, wanted to do something great for God, but this desire to belong was just deeply embedded within me. Three years more, we stayed in, in Prague, and toward the end of our time, we took a group of Christians from our church to visit a sister church in Augsburg, Germany, 
about 20 folks. And it was a good weekend. But the, the most, most boring thing was the church service. It was all in German. They did ask a couple of Czechs to, to pray once over communion and once at the end. Somehow I got nominated to do the closing prayer in Czech. And so there we were sitting through this long church service and there were some teenagers in our group who didn't speak German and for them and for most of us it was such a long sermon in a language you didn't understand. The announcement seemed to go on forever and ever. And finally when it's my turn for the closing prayer I, I came up to the podium and one of the young Czech guys said within the hearing of the Czechs around him said finally a Czech. Finally one of us when it was reported back to me what he'd said, and as I reflected upon that, I realized it wasn't that God needed me to do something spectacular. It wasn't that God was calling me to be some amazing missionary. But what God was calling me to do was simply to belong. And that met some of the deepest needs of my own heart was to belong to a supportive community committed to lifting up Jesus Christ. That is the work of the church. And I look around me here in Fresno, and I know of so many people who feel disconnected, disappointed, disillusioned, lonely. When here we have the church, which is supposed to be just simply a supportive community of people coming together to serve, to lift up a greater purpose. We don't have to be a rock star church. We don't have to save the world. But we do have to be committed to supporting the truth and the mystery of Jesus Christ by coming together in godly behavior. And if you as a church you may not be setting it on fire in terms of what standards are out there, but if you as a church are simply doing that, don't sweat the rest. You're doing enough. We wait for those words. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the rest of your master.